All right, so now we are talking to Dr. Paul Hain, who is an assistant professor at CU Boulder studying surface and atmospheric processes on terrestrial bodies like the moon and Mars. He is especially interested in ices and how they affect the atmospheres of these bodies. Dr. Hain is involved with several NASA missions, including the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO, the Mars Climate Sounder, and the upcoming Europa Clipper. He is currently the lead on an instrument slated to be launched to the moon as a part of the Artemis series of missions. This radiometer will help map the distribution of different chemicals and materials on the moon and their thermal properties. Dr. Paul Hayden, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So the first question I want to ask you is uh, if you could give us a brief overview of this thing called the Artemis mission. Sure. So Artemis is actually a program uh, that intends to put a human back on the surface of the moon by 2024. So it'll actually be a, a sequence of, of missions culminating in uh, footprints, boot prints on the surface of the moon sometime in 2024 is the plan. Um, and also going to places that we haven't been before with humans or any other uh, robotic explorers, so like places like the South Pole of the Moon. Very cool. So this is the so when we refer to Artemis collectively, it is the series of missions that will occur in succession to put people back on the Moon. Right. So in NASA parlance, that would be a program. Okay. And each part of that program will consist of a mission or or sequence of missions. So. For example, um, one of the first missions is going to be to put something called the Lunar Gateway in orbit around the moon. This is a mini space station, sort of uh, a, a smaller version of the International Space Station. It's going to go into orbit around the moon um, in a very special kind of orbit that will allow it to deposit things uh, on the lunar surface. Very cool. Thank you. So this is kind of a, a different setup for NASA. They don't always do these huge program type things. And it's also kind of special because of the way that private industry is being involved. Like we've always used private industry for, you know, manufacturing parts and instruments and stuff, but this is uh, more of like a partnership really. And I know a lot of scientists are sort of hesitant about this involvement of private industry on such a great level. What are some of you think some of the benefits of working with private industries to kind of increase our presence on the moon and in the rest of the solar system? Well, I think there's no way we could do it without commercial partnerships. And I think a lot of people forget or weren't around during the time of Apollo when commercial partnerships really made Apollo possible. Um, and that was through the employment of literally hundreds of thousands of people at, at private companies and also within NASA uh, to, to build the Saturn V rocket and the Apollo command module and everything else that we used for, uh, for those missions to the moon. And those partnerships allowed NASA to rapidly develop all the infrastructure and hardware necessary to, to do Apollo. And it's similar now, but different. And the, the key difference is that NASA has started to contract out, meaning that they are literally paying for services from another company, from an, an outside company, um, to do things that traditionally NASA would do. So for example, delivering cargo to the International Space Station. And the reason that's important is that it allows NASA to reduce the costs by a huge margin. I mean, we're talking already a factor of two cheaper than has been done previously um, through uh, existing partnerships. And so uh, by using companies like SpaceX, um, we're able to reduce the, the cost of, of space travel tremendously. And I think you know the current estimate for once SpaceX gets up to its full cadence of Falcon 9 rocket launches, uh, we're going to reduce the cost of, of each launch to the space station by a factor of 10, basically. And so that's a huge uh, reduction, obviously. And, and when essentially everything NASA does is driven not by imagination. I mean, you know, there's plenty of that to go around. It's more money, right? <laughs> and so when it comes down to it, really, we do what's within the scope of our, our budgets. And this 
re reduction in cost by increasing commercial partnerships allows NASA to, to do more. And uh, that includes going back to the moon. Do you think that this is such a big deal now because there's just so many more commercial partners available, especially things like SpaceX and Blue Origins where they're actually like launching things into space? I think it's, it's, it's a difference in quality, not quantity, or a difference in, in type of, of company that's, that's doing this. So, I th and, and I do think there has been a, a big shift in what is possible with a, a small company. Um, so for example, the lunar lander that will put our instrument from CU on the surface of the moon, that lander is being provided and built by a very small company called Maston Aerospace out in the Mojave Desert in California. And a company of that size, you know, 40 years ago, couldn't have dreamed of competing, you know, to provide a lunar lander. That would be something that the big aerospace companies like Boeing and, and Lockheed and, and Raytheon and those sorts of companies would, would provide. Um, so uh, that's one key difference is that through technology and, and um, you know, frankly, the internet and the capability to rapidly prototype and, you know, 3D print and, and all these things that we can do now, smaller companies are capable of, of doing a lot more. So I think that, you know, SpaceX is no longer a small company, but they started off small and, you know, through a massive infusion of, of money and um, intellectual capital, meaning a lot of really good people flocked to SpaceX for the opportunity, they were able to, to jump into the game, you know, with both feet, basically. And so uh, I think that really put them in a position to be able to compete with the, the dominant um, players in the, uh, you know, um, rocket launch industry, which was uh, collectively called or is collectively called ULA, the United Launch Alliance. And that's a consortium of, of the, the big um, rocket developers in the, the country. And so that's really put ULA on their heels in terms of, you know, they have to then respond by reducing their costs. And so that level of competition, I think has really, um, you know, led to sort of a new space race, really internal to, to the US and, and NASA. So when we talk about this kind of, you know, almost like this capitalist approach to, to driving costs down for NASA from third party, you know, uh, engineering companies, what about other just independent companies conducting their own research in space? Like, do you think that SpaceX, for example, or, you know, the ULA, you know, collectively will say, well, you know, we don't even need NASA. If we're not getting their contracts. We'll just go do our own science. Is that something that would be done? Or is it is NASA really kind of the centerpiece for tying all of these, uh, all of these, you know, missions and, and projects together? Well, you have to ask who derives value from science. And I think the answer is we all do, more or less, you know, <laughs> um, I hope. And so that means that that's something that, that, that we as a society choose to invest in. And that's why we have an agency like NASA that conducts research in space and, and, and about space from, from Earth. And, and so um, we have chosen to, you know, give some portion of our tax dollars to that enterprise, basically. So flipping it around, then, you know, is there a company that, that would see enough value in uh, investing in, in space research? Um, I think, you know, by definition, a company would only be interested in that if they could profit from it, right? Uh, and so then maybe you could envision a model where uh, private citizens do pay a company to do research, you know, sort of a Kickstarter or, you know, um, uh, GoFundMe type <laughs> scenario, right? Where people kick in money to see something really cool happen in space, you know? I don't think that's out of the question. At the same time, I think NASA and other similar international agencies are going to be, government agencies are, are going to be the main players in, in space research um, for the foreseeable future, just because it, it's, it's really not a profitable enterprise except for the uh, knowledge and the you know, um, collective value that we 
derive from it as a society. Very cool. So, so we'll move into kind of what you're doing a little bit more here. Uh, you are leading the development of an instrument uh, called the Lunar Compact Infrared Imaging System, or LSIRIS, once we get to know it better, uh, that will ride on board one of the three landers associated with the Artemis program. What will this instrument do, and uh, what can we learn from its observations? Yeah, so LSIRIS is a camera, but it's sort of a night vision or heat sensing camera. So it's a thermal infrared camera um, that takes pictures just, just like your iPhone, um, but it's sensing wavelengths of light beyond human vision. So it's going to sense into the thermal infrared. So everything that we see with this camera will be the emitted radiation from the heat of all the objects around us on the surface of the moon. Um, and I say us, but really this, this is a robotic lander. There's no human beings on board and, and we have a fully automated camera system that's going to uh, generate these images. So once we land on the surface, uh, the instrument will then scan to make these sort of panoramic uh, images over and over again. So we can see how things change over the course of the lunar day. Uh, and our landing site is a very unique place. We don't have it picked out yet. <laughs> but it's going to be a unique place um, near the south pole of the moon and uh, NASA or anyone else has, has never sent any anything this close to the, the lunar poles and the reason that's exciting is because we know that there are massive ice deposits at the south pole of the moon and probably the north too um, and these ice deposits are mysterious because we don't know how they got there necessarily. We have some ideas about how they got there. Maybe uh, a comet impact that delivered a bunch of ice to the surface that then got trapped, or maybe um, it's asteroids bringing in, you know, water-rich minerals, uh, or you know, it it, it could be um, left over from the formation of the moon. This is water that was there to begin with, and it just got sequestered at the poles, and the strangest idea is that it could actually be water from the solar wind which is actually made mostly of, of hydrogen or you know hydrogen stripped of of an electron uh, which is a proton basically so protons are bombarding the moon all the time as the, the moon is bathed in the solar wind and some portion of those those protons may you know find a hydrogen or an oxygen and then another hydrogen and form h2o and then that h2o could make its way to the the poles once the water is in the polar regions of the moon it can be trapped in these really special places uh, called permanently shadowed regions and this is kind of a strange situation where uh, because of the the small angle of the moon's spin axis compared to the direction of the sun, bear with me, it's spinning around its axis and the sun is always in its sort of equatorial plane. Um, that means that if you were standing at the pole of the moon, the sun would be spinning around your, your horizon uh, as the moon rotates basically. And so if you then- still The way that the earth does, where when the earth, you know, kind of goes through its seasons, then we get different parts of the earth getting more sun. That's not necessarily the case on the moon. Is that what? Exactly, what yeah. Okay. Right, yeah. And, and the earth does, you know, wobble back and forth and go through these little cycles and, and it's, it's axis tilt and that has profound consequences for our climate. Um, the moon is pretty stable and locked into that, that uh, orientation with its, its spin axis perpendicular to the uh, orbit of, of earth around the sun. Okay, and so that means that, you know, if you were sitting inside a crater at the pole of, of the moon, now imagine the sun is, is you know, going around your horizon, but your horizon is, is blocked by the walls of the crater. Okay, so the sun never comes up. And in fact, we, we think the moon has been stable in that configuration for billions of years. And so any water or other volatile material that ends up inside one of these, these permanently shadowed craters will more or less be retained for uh, billions of years. It's it's cold. So okay. So the consequence of being in shadow for billions of years is that it's very cold, right? <laughs> um, there's no sunlight and there's no atmosphere on the moon to speak of, and so therefore uh, the temperatures in these permanently shadowed regions are 
are very, very low. In fact, we think it's the uh, potentially the, the coldest place, the coldest places in the solar system are in these, these permanently shadowed regions at the poles of the moon because there's no real analogy on other outer solar system uh, objects. So we, the reason we wanna go there is because they're sort of a, a collecting box for anything that, that hits the moon and, and by extension the earth, right? So it's the earth moon system. And so any you know cometary material or anything floating out there in space that ends up uh, in the vicinity of earth and, and the moon will, you know, sort of be collected by these permanently shadowed regions. So there's, there's sort of a natural um, collector for, for space junk, you know? And by space junk, I don't mean human junk. I mean the, all the solar system junk that's, that's out there. And so we'd like to go there and sample that and see you know, what has been hitting the earth and the moon for billions of years. That would be pretty interesting to know. So that's, that's one of the main reasons. The other reason to go there is that uh, the ice in these permanent, permanent shadows is extremely valuable from a, an exploration standpoint. And that's because it, it costs um, roughly uh, a few hundred thousand dollars per gallon to bring water uh, in the vicinity of the moon, basically. And so, you know, at that cost, uh, you know, maybe Bill Gates might, or, you know, Jeff Bezos might be able to, to help out, but we, we really would, would like to be able to, to, uh, to mine it in place, right? And so the ice deposits, if, if they're substantial enough, could provide a, an extremely high value economic resource for this kind of space exploration, not just on the moon, but beyond, because you could use it as a sort of fueling depot or, or some sort of um, way station. So uh, getting back to El Cirrus, then our, our instrument will sit on the lunar surface on this lander, and it'll be um, right next to uh, one or more of these big permanently shadowed craters. And so we're going to take images of those, those craters for, for the very first time from the surface and map out where are these cold regions. I, I said that we can measure the heat. So we're gonna measure the temperature of these, these craters and see which ones are cold enough to trap ice. And then other instruments on the lander are going to actually search for that ice in those, those cold regions, including a little uh, rover, um, which is sort of like a little you know, toy rover, kind of like the Sojourner rover. I don't know if you're familiar with that on, on um, Mars Pathfinder. There was this little tiny rover that rolled off the, the lander. So we have one of those called Moon Ranger, and that's gonna rove around on the, on the surface exploring for, for ice also. So El Cirrus will help map out where that little rover should go to, to search for ice. Um, and then finally, we also learned something about the geology and the geologic history of the moon and the moon formation um, with El Cirrus because we have these compositional wavelengths that we use to look for, to look at the composition of, of the surface. So though in a nutshell, that's what El Cirrus is doing, mapping out the, the temperatures and the cold traps for water and looking at the, the composition and, and geologic history. So really quick, when we talk about the Artemis program, you know, well, my familiarity with it is, is, you know, limited probably, especially compared to yours who works on the program. But I've always, you know, we talk about, you have this SLS rocket and then you have the Orion capsule on the top, right? Which is what will hold the astronauts eventually when, when we get to that phase. Yep. Are the landers on board this, you know, this setup or is it some, will they be launched separately from that, you know, human transporting setup? Where do the landers fit in? How are they getting to the moon? Um, eventually, probably, but the launch vehicle, meaning the, the rocket that will launch our particular mission is probably not the SLS. So the SLS is the space launch system. This is the new massive rocket, uh, similar in size to the Saturn V that NASA is, is developing. Um, that will um, be ready for launching uh, the, the Artemis missions that take astronauts to the moon and also the, the gateway. But um, current estimates based on the schedule are that uh, in all likelihood, we'll, we will probably launch on, on a different rocket. So that could be a, a Falcon Heavy or it could be um, a, you know, Delta IV, it, it, it depends, but, but there are other, other launch vehicles available that could get us to the moon. That's cool that you have these kind of, you know, these missions that aren't just about the human transport also tied into the Artemis program. So it's this whole thing that is gonna say, okay, we're gonna put people back on the moon, but we're also gonna learn a ton about the moon while we're there, that's the whole point. Yeah, so that's I should say that's, that's my personal assessment. That's not an official NASA. Sure. Uh, sure. 
stance. So, so uh, SLS should be ready in time to launch the first of these landers. Um, but if, if it's not ready, then we have backup options. Right, right. Cool. And this is definitely not your first go around with designing instruments and being part of an instrument team. You've been on or led several instrument teams on different missions. Uh, can you kind of give us like a behind the scenes look of how exactly do these instruments get developed? What's sort of the process for putting an instrument on another planet? Yeah, so it's at some level extremely complicated and at some level very simple. So <laughs> the, let's start with the simple. So the simple is, is that uh, as a scientist, you come up with an idea for a really cool new measurement that's, that's never been done before because you want to answer this burning question that you have about some planetary body, maybe Europa, you know, so you say, okay, you know, I really want to know what this dark stuff around icy craters on Europa is made of. And in order to do that, I need some kind of um, chemical analysis system that's going to land on a lander. Okay. So then you go to um, someone who is an expert in the actual instruments, the technology, right? Because as a scientist, you're not expected to be in there, you know, turning bolts and, and soldering wires and stuff, right? Necessarily, some people do. Um, so those people are typically called technologists. And so you, you either seek them out or they seek you out and you come up with this idea and you don't just immediately propose an instrument from scratch to, to NASA. You, you actually first propose to develop the technology through a sequence of, of programs. So um, those are the first one is called Picasso. The next one is called Matisse. They give them these, you know, uh, fancy acronyms that <laughs> sound like artist names. So um, you work through those those pro. If you're selected for Picasso, then you work through that one, and then you propose to Matisse. And then and this is called uh, maturation. So you you mature the technology. And once you come out the end of of Matisse, then you have um, a prototype instrument that has been built in the, the laboratory somewhere at a place like JPL or uh, APL or Goddard or wherever it is. And in the laboratory, you've got this, this functioning instrument that does the kinds of, kinds of measurements that you want to do on Europa. Um, and so then at that point, you're ready to propose the actual instrument uh, to go to Europa. Um, but you're not done yet because you have to wait for an opportunity to, fl to fly, to ride along on, on some spacecraft that's, that's going to the surface of Europa. And so once you've got that technologically ready instrument, um, you wait for, for the right opportunity, the right time where, you know, NASA says, oh, you know, we are going to do a Europa lander and we're, we're asking for proposals for instruments to go on that lander. Here are the kinds of instruments that we're looking for. And you know, you say, um, "Hey, look at me! I've got this instrument, uh, and it does what you want to do." And and I'm, you know, um, the right scientist to lead the team. And so then you uh, propose to the program. And if you're selected, you're still not done because there's a sequence of uh, hurdles you have to get through with reviews and all kinds of stuff. And then finally, once you get at the other end of that, then you you are ready to go to space. And so. Um, you can see it, it gets complicated, but uh, from a high level, uh, simple point of view, it's really a scientist working with a, a team of, of technologists and engineers uh, to turn an idea into a reality, basically. Do you ever see it going the other way? Somebody saying like, hey, we're sending a mission to Europa, and you'd be like, I want to put an instrument on that. Let me go make one real quick. Does it ever work that way, or is it too quick of a turnaround? Yes, often it does work that way. So uh, there will be, you know, a team of, of engineers and, and technologists who have an instrument they've been working on, you know, that, that might already be mature. Maybe they developed it through a DOD contract or something, you know, and, and they've got this nice um, mass spectrometer that they want to fly uh, with NASA, but they don't know any planetary scientists. So they, you know, they reach out to you and say, hey, you study Europa. Um, we should propose this. And so um, it does go that way sometimes too, that scientists get contacted by um, technologists who want to fly their instrument. And then your job as a scientist is to, to, see, to take a look, a careful look at that instrument and the kinds of measurements it makes and say, what is this useful for? Like what, what science questions, what burning questions 
can I answer with, with these measurements? What, just to get a feel for kind of what this process looks like, what, if you had to guess, what fraction of instruments go all the way from someone thinks about them to they end up on a planet or a body that's not the earth? <laughs> that number is very small. <laughs> is it? So it's, it's a very competitive, if you will, uh, uh, field to, to develop an instrument. And, and it is, it. but you have to keep in mind that, that nobody's just proposing once, right? So right. You know, we, we all propose over and over and over again. And that's one of the things I, I tell students, especially, is that the, the best way to succeed in, in astronomy and planetary science in any field is, is to, to fail. <laughs> over and over again and, and and get really good at failing and by what i mean by that is is to um accept the fact that that failure is is a part of the process and not let it hurt your feelings too much you know um it does hurt of course it hurts and you, you feel it and you say okay like that stung what can i learn from this experience and and move on to the next opportunity because if you ask anybody who who you know, has an instrument that's that's on another planet. They'll tell you that there's you know, a, f a floor somewhere littered littered with you know chunks and broken parts of instruments that that failed. You know, so uh, that's that's kind of the story. There is that yeah, it's a small num small fraction, but um, most people uh, eventually succeed. I wonder if there's a place for kind of a change in in the way that we talk about how. Uh, you know, you get instruments on board, like, you know, we talk about, oh, this proposition failed, right? It didn't, you didn't get the, the you know, you didn't get to go all the way to actually putting that instrument on whatever body or, you know, whatever that you were planning. But it seems like if that's such a normal thing, you know, that that's the process. I, well, that, but then I guess I could see, you know, getting super excited that you, that your instrument finally did, you know, really make the cut. So that's interesting. Sorry, I'm just kind of rambling here. Well, I understand. I, I, I do think competition is an important part of the process. Yeah. And that, that keeps, you know, the quality very high and, and the success rate very high, you know. So that's, that's why you don't, you know, it's, it's big news when an instrument or spacecraft fails, right? Because right. it doesn't happen very often. Right. <laughs> and there's right. a reason for that. Um, that's good. Yeah. So, so we... I'm going to kind of change directions here. Um, in astronomy, we often talk about uh, geologically active or inactive bodies, uh, meaning for, for the listeners that there uh, is or isn't seismic or volcanic activity occurring somewhere on the body, right? So you can think of this body, you know, a planet or a moon or asteroid being active or inactive. Um, and more and more, uh, the consensus is that it seems to me that that the more we learn about all of these bodies that we thought were inactive, that there's not really such thing as a truly inactive body. That there is absolutely nothing happening on you know on you know some body in space. Um, what can be said about activity happening on the moon? Is there any activity happening on the moon that may impact uh, Artemis astronauts when they arrive, for example? Totally. Yeah, so so a lot of a lot of people do think of the moon as a relatively dead rock in space with not much activity. But in fact, we're starting to think that there is activity on the moon that, that may be ongoing today. And, and there, there's certainly um, external activity that is affecting the, the moon's surface, which will certainly uh, affect the Artemis astronauts uh, once they get there. So by that, I mean, there are meteorites hitting the surface of the moon constantly. You know, you can imagine the big impacts that produce craters and all that are pretty infrequent, but the impacts of the much smaller things, the kind of, of particles that we see produce uh, shooting stars, you know, meteors in our, in our sky, um, those are very common. And if, you know, if you're an astronaut on the surface and you've got your spacesuit, you know, which is protecting you from the, the vacuum of, of space, um, one of those little, you know, pebble-sized uh, projectiles is is a big deal, you know. So, so we we would like to know about that kind of activity, the external activity. There's also a lot of radiation activity in terms of of both from the sun, the solar wind, and uh, things like coronal mass ejections that introduce high energy particles um, from the sun, and then also galactic cosmic rays, which are constantly bombarding the lunar surface. These, these things cause more long-term damage 
although sometimes something like a CME can can trigger a, a power outage by um, you know discharging a whole um, circuit. So we do have to worry about the space environment affecting the the uh, activities on the, the lunar surface, not just for astronauts but also for our robotic emissaries. Um, and then there's also internal activity to the moon. So we we know from Apollo that uh, there is seismic activity both on the surface and in the deep interior of, of the moon uh, triggered by moonquakes. And the way that those moonquakes in the deep interior are, are, are triggered is, is probably due to the interaction with Earth, which is pretty interesting actually. As, as the moon moves around in its orbit around the Earth, the moon creates tides on the Earth, but the, the Earth also creates tides on the moon. And because the Earth is creating tides on the moon, that's causing some kind of squeezing and, and flexing inside the moon, which then uh, makes faults form and slip. So those, those deep moon quakes are, are mostly probably triggered by, by that kind of activity, which is ultimately the cause of, of the Earth and, and not really because of the moon's own activity, right? Um, but there are, there's, there's some, some of those moon quakes did not really match up with, with that kind of tidal forcing. And so we think there is some deep seismic activity on the moon that's caused by the moon's own internal motions or activity, um, maybe even because of, of some regions that are still melted from the formation of the moon, which is pretty surprising after um, you know four billion years that, that it would still be uh, molten down there, but it looks like at least part of it is. Um, and then finally, uh, there's some evidence for volcanic and tectonic activity, meaning um, eruptions and also uh, faulting at the, the, the surface from data from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So we see a, a few of these features. Um, one is called INA, I-N-A. And if you haven't seen a picture of INA, you should look it up. It's beautiful and stunning and, and mysterious. So it's, it's a uh, clearly a volcanic eruption feature. It's some kind of volcano lots of this, what we call pancake batter uh, blo blobby material on the surface. And uh, if, you, if you take account of all the craters on those, those features, you can kind of tell their age, at least in a relative sense. And they look very young, like maybe less than 10 million years, which is a blink of an eye in geologic terms. And so people have put forward the idea that maybe those things are, were not only active 10 million years ago, but they're active today. And that would be very surprising, you know, given how old and cold we think the moon is. So uh, if there's volcanic activity today, that's something that the Artemis missions could definitively identify and, and, and for the first time, you know, say, yes, the moon is volcanically active today or, or no, it's not. And that would tell us about the whole history of its formation and, and its interior. Um, and also, lastly, you know, we, we see lots of evidence in the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera data for um, landslides and things, uh, new fresh impacts, big craters that are formed, you know, uh, um, by literally impacts that are happening before our eyes, basically. And uh, that will, you know, those larger impacts would definitely pose a hazard to, to astronauts on the surface. Wow, so it sounds like the moon is very much not dead, you know, as, as it, we kind of think about it sometimes, you know, like, oh, you know, this moon's just a rock in space, but it's really, there's a lot going on there, it sounds. Lot going on. <laughs> yeah. Is there any consideration as to like, you know, we're sending astronauts to the moon, this is something that we talk about also with Mars, you know, when we get to that point, we have to deal with, you know, radiation that we haven't really, you know, dealt with before, and how are we going to deal with that? Is that conversation happening about putting people on the moon? Did it happen also in Apollo, you know, in that era? Yes, it is. And it's a, a big concern. I think a lot of people have spent their entire careers studying how to mitigate and uh, deal with, with radiation exposure for astronauts. Um, we deal with this all the time, by the way, for uh, robotic spacecraft, because we have to protect our electronics and, and the inner workings of, of the instruments as they fly through space over a long period of time, you know, and we've been successful with that. Like, you know, for example, there's still instruments operating on, on Voyager, you know, and those spacecraft are, are now in interstellar space. So you can, you can do this for decades. The key is that you just need enough shielding between 
the environment of space and, and your body, right? Or your electronics as the case may be. So um, that's, that's challenging, you know, because you, you need a space suit to be able to, to be um, maneuverable, right? You have to be able to, to work. And so um, you can't completely shield with, with just a space suit alone. So long-term exposure, which we didn't really encounter in Apollo because those missions were, you know, on timescales of days, not uh, months or years, that kind of radiation exposure for over a long period of time is, is a big concern. And a lot of people think that the, the moon is a good testing ground or proving ground for the kinds of technologies that people have been developing to help mitigate um, radiation exposure. Um, and also to understand the, the effects on, on the body because you know, we have a lot of experience on the International Space Station with long-term uh, um, exposure to the low Earth orbit environment but that's very, very different from um, even the moon or, or especially inter, uh, interplanetary space out um, on the way to Mars. So um, once you're on the surface of Mars, the situation is a little bit better than on the moon, but um, not a whole lot. And so it's, it's a very similar problem. Um, and yeah, the key is, the key is shielding and, and limiting the time out on the surface, basically. And that's another thing that you often hear is that they tell us that the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, but that's not 100% true, right? It has a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we call it an exosphere because it's, it's so thin that basically the, the particles that make up the atmosphere are uh, more likely to in, encounter uh, the surface of the moon than another particle, right? And so um, you can imagine the the particles bouncing around, hopping across the lunar surface, and, and only very rarely meeting each other, you know? And so that's, that's called a, a surface-bounded exosphere. And the moon's exosphere is, is actually really interesting because it, it it's, again, sort of tells you about the local space environment, the things that the moon is kind of sweeping up um, in its orbit around Earth and Earth's orbit around the sun. Um, but it's also interesting from this, the point of view of, of this whole volatiles and, and water story you know, because anything that is in the moon's atmosphere, um, if it makes its way to one of these permanently shadowed regions at the poles, it could be trapped in, in the, the very cold uh, regions. And so we have to understand the lunar atmosphere to understand what's in those polar cold traps, those, those polar uh, craters. And so, um, yeah, there's been a lot of work trying to understand how much water there is in the lunar atmosphere which would then tell you about how much makes its way into those ice deposits at the poles. Um, so, in the, just to be clear, that's a gravitational thing, is that right? That it's the moon's gravity, although it's much less than the Earth's, is you know uh, initially you know uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ultimately, what we can kind of attribute it's holding on to this this exosphere. That's right. Yeah. So, so the moon. Even though it's it's smaller than Earth, it's it's actually a relatively large uh, terrestrial body in, in the, the scheme of our solar system, right? So there's lots lots of moons that are smaller than our moon, and, and not many that are bigger. So uh, it has appreciable gravity. You know, it's one sixth of Earth's gravity, and that's enough to to hold on to those atoms and molecules that that are in the lunar atmosphere. So that's why they hop around the surface from place to place instead of just escaping to space. So you can imagine a body like, I don't know, um, Saturn's moon uh, Mimas, you know, um, Mimas doesn't have the gravity to, to hold on to um, uh, an atmosphere as much as the moon does. Got it. Thank you. So another one of the projects that uh, you talk about uh, on your website, which is where I was, you know, kind of looking through, uh, one of your projects involved watching the surface of the moon cool during a total lunar eclipse. So the moon is in the Earth's shadow. It's not seeing direct sunlight that it usually does, and so then it cools off. Uh, what were you doing in this experiment? Why was it uh, important, and what did you learn from it? Yeah, so this is something that hasn't really been done in the modern era. One of the first experiments that was done using ground-based telescopes with infrared detectors was actually watching lunar eclipses. And there was a good reason for that. It was because they wanted to know what the moon's surface was made of. You know, like at that time they didn't have any idea. It could be green cheese, right? So they 
they watched the cooling of, of the moon during an eclipse um, to see what the, the surface materials were, were made of. And, and the reason you can do that is because, you know, if you imagine uh, coming outside just after sunset, okay, and you're looking around uh, your environment, and you see a sandbox, okay, and, and then you also see uh, a brick patio. Um, you can ask the question, okay, you know, when, when the sun is up, I would think that the sand is going to be pretty hot, right? And maybe the bricks are, are a little bit cooler. When the sun goes down, it's reversed. So, so then the sand cools off faster and the bricks stay warm longer. And if you come out in the middle, middle of the night, this is even more obvious, right? So you, you go to the sandbox and you feel the sand is going to be cold. You feel the bricks and they're still warm at night. I'm sure a lot of people have experienced this. So same idea. So if you know nothing about the, the moon, uh, you can measure its cooling during the eclipse where basically the sun turns off in an instant, more or less, um, and the surface starts to cool off and then it warms back up. You can use that cooling to infer uh, whether you're looking at brick or sand, basically. And, and it turns out that you're looking at something closer to sand than brick. <laughs> so we wanted to take that to the next level, um, which is to actually you know, make images. And so we have these, these beautiful uh, global image mosaics of, of the moon's surface during the, the eclipse, where you see, you know, rocks around craters glowing brightly compared to their surroundings and like the ray like ejecta from Tycho and, you know, like all kinds of fascinating features. And um, so we're in the process of, of studying those um, data and uh, we'll publish that soon. That's super cool. So we're going to switch a little bit now because we always like to get a little personal with our interviews there at the end. Um, and I definitely wanted to ask you about this really awesome thing. That no more you questions. <laughs> <laughs> Not that kind of person. <laughs> but no, I wanted to ask you about um, the Ad Astra Academy that you work with. It's super cool. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of their mission and, and the kind of things that you do with Ad Astra? Yeah, so Ad Astra is an organization that we founded in 2015 uh, to work with underserved students in uh, mainly developing countries, but also in the US, um, who are not exposed to cool science. <laughs> and so that's, that's basically the gist of it, is to get kids involved in not only learning about science, but doing science. And we like to involve them directly in NASA missions and, you know, research uh, cruises with, you know, research boats and, and that sort of thing. Um, and to get them to tap into their natural curiosity that otherwise, you know, we think would, would basically go dormant, we want to awaken it and, and give them opportunities that, that they wouldn't normally have. And so, we involve, you know, NASA scientists and, um, you know, researchers who are working direct, directly with these NASA missions and, and biological uh, missions and stuff to, um, to help the students look at real actual science data. And, you know, for example, um, we had the students in the first, uh, first program in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 2015, we had them uh, request images from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter high-rise camera of locations on Mars that had never been imaged at that resolution. So no one had ever seen an up-close shot of that location on Mars. And so they had to come up with a science justification for, you know, why they wanted to, to study this place on Mars that had never been seen before and, and a whole, you know, research plan for what they were going to do with it. And then they proposed it to the NASA uh, team and then uh, the images were acquired. Um, we did a big unveiling ceremony and they got to like, you know, look at the images for the first time and then do their, their um, mock rover traverse across the image, um, you know, studying the, the surface in more detail. So, so that sort of thing. And, and also just doing uh, hands-on activities outside of the classroom that they normally don't um, get a chance to do. So we, we build like a scale model of the solar system. We um, take them on a, a field trip that's usually either uh, biology or geology oriented, um, which is something these kids, you know, typically don't have any opportunity to do. And, and um, we've been pretty successful in, in encouraging students not not just to become scientists because we're not 
naive. You don't think that everyone's going to become a scientist, but but to at least you know pursue that interest and and uh, maybe think about you know studying science and at the university level. So right now we've we've done programs in Brazil several times and uh, Bangladesh and um, Oakland, California, and um, Nigeria, and we are looking to expand. During the year of COVID, we're looking to expand more locally uh, in, in uh, the US, including um, juvenile detention centers in Colorado. That is fantastic. Like hearing you talk about this program is just awesome. I think, you know, you, it makes total sense. You know, a lot of the times people uh, think about science and it's to them, it's totally, uh, it it's like it's like you know talking about having to go and do groceries you know it's something that you just <laughs> that, you, that they've been taught to to really kind of dislike or get bored with or even fear you know if they had a bad experience in like a physics class one time and I think that's really great that that you're really focusing on kind of awakening that curiosity and saying no it's not scary or bad uh it's it's all it is is being curious and doing that for a living. That's that's your whole job as a scientist, is to right. be professionally curious. So that is really cool. Yeah, I think everyone has that inherent or innate curiosity, and I think you know from a very early age we we do science. You know, we we learn about the world through experimentation. You know, oh, is this stove hot? I'm going to touch it and see. <laughs> Mom uh, says it is, but yeah. I don't know if I can, I can't just take her word for it, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I think all kids are curious and, and unfortunately in some cases that curiosity gets pounded out of some kids and um, we, we just seek to, to catch them at the right age where we can, you know, say, look, the world is fascinating and, and you're allowed to be curious and you're allowed to ask questions. That is wonderful. So I, uh, in that vein, uh, what advice would you give to young listeners who feel inspired to study planetary bodies in our solar system and beyond? Yeah, I mean, the main, I, I would say the main advice is, is to stick with it. If it's something that you're really passionate about, uh, be prepared for failure. Um, you don't want to fail all the time. You want to learn from your mistakes, but you almost inevitably are gonna encounter some failures, some, some big, some small. And perseverance is the number one quality that I've seen in, in my scientific colleagues. And so um, that's the number one piece of advice is don't give up. Um, you need to work hard. That's absolutely true and do good work. <laughs> uh, and also play nice. I see a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the most successful people in science and those who are having the most fun <laughs> are those who are, are kind to one another, you know, and, and you know, you, it, it can be a, a competitive field, but um, there's a way to be competitive, but also conscientious and, and a, a good citizen. And so I think doing good work, working hard, being nice and uh, picking yourself up from failure. Those are the main things. And then in terms of opportunities, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to, to people whose work you find interesting. You know, you, you may not get an answer. And you may not get an answer um, after several tries, but don't give up. It's another another case not to give up. Just keep being persistent and, you know, eventually you'll, you'll find the right connection that will lead to a wonderful career. I had a piano teacher in high school who came and talked. He was also like a motivational speaker he was, you know, super into that. And, and he came and talked to a theater class in my high school once. And he was talking, there was a student in our class who, who had written a letter to uh, Michelle Obama. And I can't remember what it was about, but she wrote this letter. And, and Mitch, my, my teacher who came in and spoke was like, you know, it's, it's highly probable that you don't hear back from Michelle Obama herself because she's <laughs> a very busy woman. And, and, you know, that this is, this is perhaps a stretch, but but, and he pointed out that that student was ahead in all of us as far as getting in touch with Michelle Obama. No one else had written a letter to her. And so it was kind of a cool lesson that you're right, you might not hear back, but the instant you write, you, your chances are infinitely greater, you know, than, than if you had never done anything and never made contact at all. So. Yeah, 
that reminds me of a, I read about a study once looking at um, uh, young people who, who would go dancing or, or whatever, and, and they were interviewing people from different cultures. And the, the one culture where the, the men were, were most bold and, and unafraid of rejection was the Israeli culture. And they, they interviewed these guys and asked, you know, um, why does it, you know, why are you able, how are you able to, to ask women to, or men as the case may be, to, to dance uh, without fear and, and not get your feelings hurt, you know? And, and um, you know, by and large, they said, well, you know, the way I look at it is that if I don't ask them to dance, then, uh, then you know, nothing's changed. If I ask them to dance and they say, no, nothing's changed, you know? So if I... I if I try, then maybe they say yes. I think that is a fantastic lesson for everyone. <laughs> um, just the last little bit here real quick. Would you tell us a little bit about your story? How did you kind of get to where you are and where do you maybe see yourself going in the future? Okay, well, where to begin? How far back? <laughs> I mean, I, I guess, you know, I've always been interested in, in science, I think my, um, in terms of my career, because that's kind of what you're asking about, uh, I got interested in, in astronomy and, and planetary science specifically because of Carl Sagan, like a lot of people from my generation, you know? And um, I think, you know, for me, there were a lot of, you know, I'm a very curious person, so there were a lot of different directions I could see myself going in. But uh, in the end, it was a, um, it was a, a talk that I saw, a lecture when I was a, an early college student uh, by a guy named Christopher Chiba, who was a student of, of Carl Sagan's. And this was around the time when the Galileo mission was starting to return a lot of its its new images of the Jupiter system, and I think you know the scientists had been looking at these for a while, but I had never seen any of the images, and I had never heard certainly that uh, Europa, the second moon of, of Jupiter and one of the, the four largest satellites, um, might have an ocean under its surface, and that ocean could have life, you know, and and I think even almost even more than the idea of, of life beyond Earth, it was the pictures of Europa that he was showing that you know, showed this kind of crisscross, cracked, pockmarked surface that had clearly been broken apart multiple times. And, and to just to think that there was an ocean underneath that icy layer that, you know, if we could just get down there, we could, we could see it, you know, and, and explore it. That to me, like, hooked me on planetary science. So I, I, I credit that, that lecture or, you know, that, those pictures for um, bringing me back to, to planetary science where I think Carl Sagan had been kind of pushing me the whole time. Did that happen all at once when you, when you, ha you know, were at that lecture? Did, as soon as, like, did something click and you thought to yourself, this is what I have to do? Or did it kind of happen gradually where, you know, a week passed and you found yourself just continually returning to this and then a month and then in a year you thought, man, I'm really hooked on this planetary science. I think it was more of an epiphany. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, and that's not to say that it was a sudden event because it was a long circuitous process. I thought I wanted to study biology and then you know, I thought I wanted to study cosmology and, you know, so it was um, a long process. But by the time I got to that lecture, when, you know, he was talking about the geologic history of Europa and, and the deep interior ocean and, and potential for exotic life. And so I was like, this is so cool. I have to do this, you know. So it was pretty sudden at that point. And then I kind of, I didn't really know where to begin. So I, I approached him um, after the lecture and, and he pointed me to another professor who was doing you know, Europa geophysics and I got in touch with him and one thing led to another. That's pretty neat. And so, and that was, you said this was in, that lecture occurred while you were in your undergrad, is that right? Yes, and I would say even at that point, I, 
I think I, I wasn't mature enough or I didn't have the, the drive necessary. I had drive, but I didn't really know how to pursue a career in that. And so it, it still took me a while to kind of figure that out. So it's not to say that because I had this epiphany, then all of a sudden everything was roses. You know, it was, it was a, a difficult journey, but, um, but that's, that's what triggered my interest, yeah. And do you have any, you know, right now, obviously, you're, you're at CU uh, teaching and doing lots of research. Uh, is there anywhere, you know, far off in your future, is there a, a particular goal that you are kind of aspiring towards um, or something that you, you know, are really excited to, uh, you know, get to one day? Or is it the, just this process of, of continually, continuously being curious and, and, you know, working with the people that you work with that is really, you know, what you're going for? Well, long term, I want to get down into that ocean on Europa. Oh, there you go. We tie it all the way back to that. Yeah, that, that would be, you know, I think in terms of the, the, the crowning experiences of my life, I, I hope maybe we might be able to at least get on the surface. But I would really like to see us yeah. get into that ocean. Um, and then sh more short term, uh, we've got some projects on the table for exploring the polar regions of Mars. Which I think are pretty exciting. So this is a relatively unexplored part of the red planet and the most important region for the climate of Mars. And so we, we want to get down on the surface of the polar ice caps, um, drill down into the ice caps, take an ice core and see what those layers in the ice tell us about the climate history of, of Mars. So I'm kind of excited about that. We've got a proposal that we're putting together for some miniature uh, micro landers that will land on the ice caps in, in multiple different locations and measure the uh, meteorological uh, conditions and also the surface ice properties. So uh, those are more short term. By short term, I mean like, you know, next couple of decades. <laughs> Still in science, that seems, you know, next couple of decades, that seems pretty close. You know, yeah. it's in reach. You can almost touch it. Uh, really quick, one last thing. I, re I recall in, in my freshman intro astronomy class for which you were the, the professor, uh, at one point you mentioned, I think someone actually asked a question. You had showed us this picture, is, there was this beautiful picture of Boulder that appeared to have been taken from the Flatirons and it was at sunrise. And someone asked, well, Dr. Hain, what were you doing there so early in the morning? And you mentioned that you go up there and meditate in the mornings. Is that still the case? Do you go, do you hike to the Flatirons every day and meditate? What, what does that look like? Well, I have a six-month-old at home now, so uh, not so much anymore. <laughs> but, right, sure, sure. But, uh, but yeah, I did. Uh, that was a, a practice of mine for quite a while. I still try to, to get out and, and hike when I can. It's just a little bit less often. Right, sure. I always thought that was super cool. You know, I don't know if you knew this, but you know, a ton of us went home after that lecture. We were like, who is this person? We're like learning from like this like wizard or something it was yeah it was super no, cool no, no, no. don't don't have any illusions oh 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 sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well uh dr paul hain thank you so much for speaking with us it was super interesting to hear about the science that you're working on and uh it's exciting to look forwards into the future about these you know this program the artemis program and also perhaps getting to europa's ocean so thanks a lot for your time yeah thank you very much it was a pleasure